What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder alongside Ryan Sullivan on this Tuesday evening. Uh, Ryan, first of all, how are you doing? Good to see you as always. I'm doing great. We finally had a day here in Connecticut that wasn't like 10 degrees all day. It was like 30, which for the weather that we've been having here has been was very nice. There's, I think there's something poetic and and inspiring about, you know, you have a couple five degree days, you really appreciate the 30 degree days. I think there's a lesson in there for life. Um, but yeah, so it's been nice. How are you doing, Mitch? I'm doing good. I agree with you. The, 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 the warm weather, uh, which seems crazy to say, but the Northeast for those who don't live in the Northeast has been freezing here for like what, two weeks. So I was happy today. I could finally get outside, get a good run in sun's out, you know, so uh, you know, really can't complain on us. You really can't complain. And uh, I guess we'll get things started off here, Ryan. I mean, we were, we were talking about it right before we went on. It's been a very eventful day, but uh, the GOAT officially calls it a career. And this, I got to say, like, it's kind of wild when you think about this, Ryan, that like Brady, first of all, has been in the NFL every year of my life. I, I think that's unbelievable because I'm 22. He's played 22 years in the league. I think that's crazy. And second of all, I saw a tweet that yeah, Brady mentioned a few years ago that the day he retires is the day when he starts sucking. Isn't it kind of amazing that at 40, he he, he never was bad. Like, like he might be MVP I, this year. This might be his best. He, this year might have been his best season. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's wild. And you know that's what I thought. I was like, I was talking with my friends about this, and I'm I really thought you look at the way Peyton Manning went out, right? Peyton Manning right. got my one of my friends who's a Bronco fan says it best. He he got weakened at Bernie his way to a Super Bowl. He his corpse got dragged to a Super Bowl by uh, all time 0.01% defense in Denver. You know, you remember that season? Brock Osweiler carried the meat of that season, really. Yep. And and it really that Super Bowl had nothing to do with him. Um and so he was dragged off the field. He he played until he couldn't play anymore. You look at what Ben just went through. Ben, this last Two years were really quite horrific uh, versions of himself. You know, Philip Rivers kind of went out on a high note last year, but I really thought the type of quarterback that the type of person that he was, he was going to have to, he would finally leave when he had, you know, a, a Ben Roethlisberger type season where he couldn't right. throw the football, but you know, his, maybe his pride got the better. He saw that, you know, this was it. And, you know, I wonder how much of his mind was made up before the playoffs. Cause I wonder if getting hit, 12 times by Aaron Donald and company at age 44 can kind can maybe be a come to Jesus moment, but really, really surprising. And also the, the two or three hours where uh, Patriots Twitter didn't think they were going to get a proper thank you from him. Yeah. And he had like a nine page swipe right thing on Instagram and didn't mention them once was a nice little chef's kiss on, on everything. Oh, absolutely. I, I love seeing Patriots Twitter just melt down this afternoon, which is already in and of itself just crazy because it's like, you, you know, Brady owes them nothing. I mean, he's brought them six Super Bowls, 20 years of just nothing but winning and success. So, listen, I personally don't understand why they were so butthurt, honestly, for lack of a better word to put it. Um, but, yeah, and, and it's really – it is – kind of crazy with Brady. I mean, personally, I felt that Brady was going to retire just because at this point going into this season, I mean, what, what left does he have to prove for himself? He's got every record passing yards, passing touchdowns. He's got numerous playoff records. He's got all the Super Bowl rings. He proved that he can do it outside of Bill Belichick in New England last year. Like at this point, even though he still probably could suit up and play next year and probably be pretty good based off what we saw in 2021, it just seems like at this point for Brady, it's like you're 44. Just go spend some time with your kids, man. Like, you know, it's been 22 seasons, like call it a career. And, and, and that's what he did. So um, I'll say this. So as much as I hated Brady during his time in the Patriots, as I'm sure you, Ryan, and everyone who's listening probably my childhood. did. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ruin took ruin our childhoods, man. Absolutely. I, I all you can do is tip your cap though to that guy because uh, I don't personally think we're ever going to see anything like Tom Brady ever again. You know, it's one of those things as much as I hate him. And and, and I really, I, I hate Tom Brady. There are very few people I have as much anger in my heart for as Tom Brady. <laughs> right. But I, I can say when, when I'm old and I have kids and grandkids and I can say that 
you know, for five, six, seven times, I saw Tom Brady came in, he beat our, beat our asses, but I saw Tom Brady play in person live six, seven, eight, nine times in my life. I can't, I can't think of how many right now, but I saw Tom Brady play live a lot. And that might be one of the cooler things looking back on it that I've get to see in terms of just watching historic players. And, you know, he really is the Michael Jordan of, of this, of this era of football. And you know, in fact, I don't know who put the original tweet out. Someone was asking, you know, if you made a, if you made a Mount Rushmore of all sports who would be on it, you know, and he is a guy who would absolutely have to be on it representing football. And I see a lot of stuff out there about, Oh, is he going to come back and OC the Patriots? And I think we have to remember, I don't, I don't think people realize how much of a grind that the assistant coach life is in football and how not fun it is. And he would really be making less money to work more hours and not that much stuff. And I think that transitions well into, we have a new, Offensive coordinator. We lost a coach this week at Buffalo. Brian Dable goes to the Giants. And now, as of today, after a whole lot of really annoying saga about is McDermott toxic? Do people hate him? Uh, Ken Dorsey gets elevated. I think what we were all kind of expecting for a while. Ken Dorsey is now the OC in Buffalo. So I guess let's, I think the first thing to really start with that is. Are where do you think this offense goes from here? Do you think Dave? Do you think Dorsey was the right move for Buffalo? I I, I think so because Josh Allen endorsed him right right at the end of the year. Allen, without saying his name, basically said Ken Dorsey is the guy that I want as my offensive coordinator. And as much as you know, I know some people are saying, well. You know, maybe continuity is not a good thing. The thing that honestly, Ryan, made me feel even better about this move for Buffalo was that there were supposedly at least a half dozen other teams that were interested in hiring Ken Dorsey as their offensive creators this offseason. So his name was hot, not just between Buffalo and the Giants. It was hot all across the league. There were a lot of teams that wanted Ken Dorsey on their staff. So I think that's a bill saying that should make you feel pretty good. That this isn't just a, oh, let's keep status quo. That this is a guy that, Across the NFL, universally speaking, everyone, a lot of people believe he's got a really bright future as a, as a, as an offensive coordinator. And I guess what I want to see from this offense, I think there's there's there's, I want to see I think a, a better screen game. Uh, as much as I think you know, Dable, no question, very good offensive coordinator, of course, hence why he's a head coach. But I think the Bills' screen game was pretty, you know, subpar mm-hmm. under Dable. I think desired. Can, yes, I think if if if, if Dorsey can get that aspect of this uh, of things going that'd be great and i think also um i don't know like i i don't want to just say the run game because it's so just like bland and generic but just like maybe figuring out a run scheme that works best with the bills personnel that they have because it felt like up until the end of the season the bills really didn't have an identity is what their run game is or what it was going to be so i think if, if he can go in and, 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 and kind of establish that early on because you know the explosive down the field passing with Josh Allen is inevitably going to be there with the weapons they have. I think if he can get those two things a real part of this offense, I mean that's huge if you're if you're the Bills. No, I broke this down into kind of pros and cons. And obviously the con is you know and I think is a reasonable concern is he's never called plays before. He has mm-hmm. only been a quarterback coach and you don't know what kind of offense he's going to bring you don't know what he looks like as a play call you don't know right so much of play calling to his feel right you only script the first 15 plays of a game and learning the feel of a game so we don't know how much of a hand he's had in play calling up to this point that's something you're going to have to learn and there's going to be bumps in the road for him so i think that's something to, to kind of prepare ourselves for there might be a slip up here or there but even dable wasn't perfect no oc is perfect um but there might be a learning curve when it comes to so and that's it. But I think one thing that I'm I'm really grateful for and that I was nervous about that if the Bills had to go an outside hire, that they were going to bring in someone or whoever came in was going to try to make this a more traditional quarterback offense, right? And and neglect what Josh Allen brings as a quarterback or brings as a runner. And I'm glad. We have Dorsey because Dorsey's someone who worked with Cam Newton in an offense that really featured his legs, has seen Josh Allen with his legs. So we know that that's something that's going to be a part of this offense 
And when you have to account for a runner like Josh Allen, that, that makes your offense that much harder to defend. When you have to account for every single person on the field, it makes your offense that much more problematic. And I think that's a good baseline. I think that sets the floor pretty high for this offense. But, you know, the pro is, I think in the first, if they if he can hit the ground running right, he, there's not going to be tape on him. They're not going to know what kind, what he's running. They're going to know. So fresh start, you know, deep, NFL really is a league of, of adjustments. And what you put on tape one year, teams are going to adjust to that the next year. You know, just look at this AFC championship game now. You bet, can bet you're behind that teams are going to be playing Kansas City, rushing three, dropping eight. And until they can figure out, Kansas City can figure a way to stop that. That's going to be a thing they see next year. So it, it's going to be, I, I think if he can hit the ground running, a lot of potential there, but obviously he's got to learn as a play caller, but having your quarterback happy, happy matters. You, you've seen what some of the quarterbacks have in the league have gone through now with when they're not happy with personnel, not happy with, with not having a say And Josh Allen had a say, and I think that's buys you some good organizational juju going forward. Absolutely. And I think on top of that too, like the players for the bills, all of them, you know, I know specifically like Isaiah McKenzie was tweeting a lot today about how excited he was. And it just seems like that for Dorsey does bring a lot of good, positive energy into that Bill's locker room. And at the end of the day, like, you know, he, he knows the personnel he has and the players know him. There's a real trust, which I think had they brought in someone outside, you know, you got, you got to build up that relationship. These guys know Dorsey. They've, they've played for him, worked with him over the last several seasons. And I think that is something that is really important kind of in, in this hiring. And I really, I will say too, and this, this I, I say this half jokingly, but I, I was bored. So I was looking through his old Miami teams. First of all, Ken Dorsey's younger than Tom Brady, just to kind of tie that into the previous conversation. He's four years younger than Tom Brady and he feels like, he, and he's been coaching for like seven years. So I think that's kind of funny. But I was looking back at some of his Miami teams. If you guys don't know, Ken Dorsey was on like those Miami teams. And I look back and you look at some of the guys on those teams, God. Uh, Frank Gore, Clinton Portis, Willis McGahee, Ed Reed, Jeremy Shockey, Brian McKinley. And, you know, I think any guy who can survive those U teams, I think ha has to have a certain swagger or a certain, or a certain aura to him or a certain, at least a certain level of, of respect that, that he care, or confidence he carries with him because those were some, those were some very, uh, exciting teams was a very teams with a lot of personality. So I, I think he knows how to be a leader in that respect. And maybe, maybe you know, maybe I'm, I'm overselling that a little bit, but I think, you know, it, he's a guy who people know, right? He, he's got cachet. He's got, you know, name recognition. And he's also, like you said, he's, he's been doing, he's a quarterback coach for a while. He's been around a lot of offensive coordinators. He's, you know, he's been, he's been, excuse me, he's been, He's auditioned for jobs before. He's interviewed for jobs before, so you know he has a portfolio of the things he's gonna like. He's not he's not some guy who who just got into the league last year. So you know he's on a play call. I'm not too concerned. I really, if you ask, I don't see a ton of stuff changing, but hopefully just enough stuff that we you know we see a little bit of improvement because that's all you can really hope for. You do a little bit of improvement here, a little bit of improvement there. Talking about a lot of improvement though, the Cincinnati Bengals. Mm -hmm. are going to the Super Bowl, which sounds <laughs> really, really, really weird Yeah, to say out loud. The Cincinnati Bengals are going to the Super Bowl in a game that was everyone thought was over at halftime. I want to start with this question because this is a question that really kind of annoyed me on Twitter this week and or a, a discourse that really frustrated me. Do you think the Bengals getting to the Super Bowl in year two with Burrow puts either a puts pressure on the bills to get it right quickly, not and, and get in the super bowl next year or, or another way to phrase that. Do you think it delegitimizes kind of this build since the bills have been building for four years at, and in the Bengals in year two with Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow coming off an ACL injury goes to a super bowl. Do you think that puts pressure on Buffalo? Do you think that shines negatively on Buffalo? Do you have any takeaways on Buffalo or do you think it's just kind of football being football? Um, I think, so I think some of it, you have to look at it is like, you know, the NFL it's, it's 
like a matchup based league, right? It's week to week with your matchups. And I think that we can like, I think you can say like, listen, despite the bills being the number one defense, I think it's fair to say that maybe their defense doesn't match up with Kansas city all that well. And that although the Bengals defense isn't as that, you know, consistent number one defense, I think they're like 17th or something like that. Maybe as their past defense ranking, um, you know, they match up maybe a little bit better with the, I, I guess my point is like the playoffs are crazy, right? It's single elimination. So it's, it's win or go home. And for all we know, Ryan, like if the Bengals and Chiefs played seven times, maybe that was the only time the Bengals win, you know, but it's a one to it was, but that was the one time they won. Like, I, I, I think I look at it as I don't think you take away so much from Buffalo. I think that Joe Burrow is awesome and just kind of has been carrying that team a bit, you know, with the weapons he has, but you know, again, no O line inconsistent defense. So I don't know how much it is as like an indictment of like how salmon things, because at the end of the day, Buffalo is right there. I mean, that's, they almost, they should have beat the chiefs. Right. And the Bengals who won, I mean, it was a close game with the chiefs. Like the bills are a super bowl caliber team. There's no doubt about it. And if you think otherwise after this postseason, then, you know, you, you, you're crazy. I think, because it, it appears to me that the Bengals and the bills, there's not really any separation there. I mean, yes. Would you have liked to see the bills in that position over a Bengals team that's in, you're three of Zach Taylor, you're two of Joe Burrow. Absolutely. I mean, that definitely is, is something that doesn't sit quite well. But at the same time, I don't think you can take away from the fact that, you know, Cincinnati, like they got hot at the right time. They got the right matchups that work for them. I mean, they had to play Raiders, you know, Titans to order to get in that position. I mean, I'm not trying to take away from their postseason run here, but they had some favorable matchups to get there. To that. So, I guess I, I, I'm not super worried about Buffalo. I don't think that fans should be panicking that, oh, this build isn't going well because this team is very close to being in the Super Bowl. And this year could have easily been that year for them. So um, I personally am not concerned. I think there's the Bengals. It's just kind of that year in the NFL, man. It's been a weird year and the Bengals are in it. I, I really chalk it up to football, I guess. You could argue that sitting there they decided seeding didn't matter and you could argue that the four seed was the right play the right thing to play for in this playoffs they got a questionable raiders team that that got in by the skin of their teeth they got a titans team which finally had all its weapons back but i think when you play when you don't have your weapons together for that long and all of a sudden you expect them to gel after two weeks off after half a season off for some of these guys. Derrick Henry had a steel plate in his foot, right? You know, it, it's not always going to go right. And their games weren't pretty. They I, Look at how they beat Tennessee. They got sacked nine times against Tennessee. And they scored, what, 19 points in that game? One touchdown, right? It it, it depends. Sometimes it's very matchup dependent. I think Aaron Quinton, it's matchup dependent. And that's not, like you said, it's not take away anything because – Joe Burrow really balled out over the last half of this season. And he looks like a, a real dude in that conversation with Allen Herbert Mahomes over the next 20 years of this league. But I, I understand the frustration when people look at it, big like, man, how they get there. But, you know, they didn't really do anything that crazy in the beat the chiefs that, that isn't already on the books, right? If you want to beat a team, you get home with, with your front four, in this case, front three. And if you can do that and do that regularly, you're going to beat them. And that's what happened in this game. And sometimes you're, you're deep, your guys just play really well. And like you said, they get hot. We've seen teams worse than Cincinnati get hot. Both, both those Giants team that won Super Bowls were not good <laughs> regular season. We're not what we would call good regular season teams, right? We, we've seen worse teams get hot go on runs and, and win Super Bowl. So it's frustrating. I understand where the frustration is. But, you know, they're a team that that could easily regress next year too. They got a lot of free agents that they kind of built this team around. And I understand the frustration, but I don't think it's the same thing with what the Bills have done. Because football, just like Bruce had what we had on uh, this summer, it, it's being as good as you can for as long as you can. And the Bills are, will be there year after year after year. And eventually something is going to break your way. 
on the other side, the NFC, I think the other interesting conversation to look at is the way the Rams have built this team, how the Rams built their team, excuse me. And that is, that is not giving a shit about your first two round <laughs> draft picks historic. I don't, I think, I don't think they have a first round draft pick until 2045. I, it is a really unique way they built their football team. And I made the analogy this week on Twitter that it's kind of like Josh Allen. A lot of teams are going to make mistakes in their quarterback development, quarterback evaluation process. They're going to say, oh, we have the super raw toolsy quarterback who kind of sucked in college. And if we're patient, we wait, he could one day be MVP. And that's not true. Josh Allen is one in a thousand player, one in a million type player. And I think what the Rams have done here is a kind of a one in a million thing. You really need to make sure the stars you get are stars. Jalen Ramsey, you know, they got him when he was really good. There's no guarantee that you get a guy like that. He's going to stay that good, especially in a position like quarterback, right? It's not often that a quarterback, the caliber of Matt Stafford is all of a sudden available for trade. That's super rare, right? And, and if, if they're still rolling with Jared Goff, right, do they make this game? Probably not. But my question is, as I just kind of picked apart the, this aura around them, do you think there's anything we can learn from their build? Is there any takeaways you have from the Rams that that maybe can help put the Bills over the hump? I think the the one thing I can say for the Rams, the one thing that they have shown it's not necessarily like, oh, like who cares about salary cap and draft picks, but it's like you can never have enough talent on your roster. That's the one thing I think they've shown because even this season when their offense was going really well, right? What do they do? Odo Deco- Odo Beckham becomes available and they add him to their roster. I, I think it's just never being satisfied with what you have. I think that's maybe lessons the Bills can learn a little bit where, you know, if you have an opportunity to get better despite how good your team may be. It can't hurt to kick the tires and, 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 and add that guy into your roster. No, that doesn't mean, like I said, trading away all your picks being up against the cap for, you know, a billion years. But I, I think they've shown that you need there. It doesn't hurt to be a little aggressive sometime when it comes to roster building. Well, but and, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you well, go ahead. I was going to say that, that they built their team. I, I the Bills have built their team where they have a bunch of B plus players. I think and right. a handful, a handful of A plus. Right, you have your Josh Allen, your Jordan Poyer, your Trey White, and then everyone else is kind of B plus in Buffalo. B plus, B minus, um, players. What the Rams have done is they have a a lot more A plus players, and everyone else is kind of B minus, C plus. Right, you look at. You look at their running backs, right? Cam Akers is a good player, but you look at the rest, you kind of look at the rest of that team, Tyler Higby, Troy Reader, you know, their linebackers in general. They aren't that great. They're they're starting Eric Weddle for Christ's sake, who all of a sudden came out of retirement from, out of like three years of retirement and is playing safety and like not playing spectacularly. So they kind of where Buffalo is kind of you know hoping that that having a bunch of really good players, they're getting star players and hoping that those C minus players and take them in and work, right? It, it, there's two different ways to skin a cat there. And to your point there, there's a give and take when it comes to cap stuff. And, and there's a nuanced conversation that needs to go with it because yes, cap can very much be manipulated cap. You, you can, you can take money from contracts or right? I think every year there's going to be a conversation coming up with, do you want to borrow money from Josh's contract? Do you want to borrow money from Dion's contract? Do you want to borrow money from Poyer's contract, right? There's going to be an opportunity to, to save money, and but it's how much you want to do that because eventually you do get yourself into a mess. And Tampa's going to have that situation this year with, with their team, right? They're going to have to, after this year, they're going to have Chris Godwin's going to have to walk. They're going to see some guys walk off that team. The Saints, people say, well, the Saints do it every year. Well, they do because they have to cut players. They have to get rid of guys. Guys have to walk. But I, I, I think your point, to sum it up is right you there is a a fine line of being aggressive and being reckless and i really think they've found that sweet spot and it takes it's taken look it's taking timing right they matt stafford not a guy who's always available in, in that spot but it's 
that I think that's the lesson you, we can take from a team like that is is that's that fine line between aggressive and reckless. And I will say I'm glad they made it because with the Bengals making it, I felt like my my world knowledge of football. The Bengals have an awful offensive line. Everything I've known about football is that if you have an offensive line, your team's going to be bad. And they're in the Super Bowl. If Jimmy Garoppolo made it to another Super Bowl, I don't know what I would do with myself because that that's a bad quarterback. Like I don't know, not a bad quarterback. He's okay quarterback. But if we had a bad offensive line and a mediocre quarterback in the Super Bowl, I'm just gonna, I don't know, stop watching football because I don't understand well, anything. Yeah. Everything in my <laughs> life has told me that's not how you win, and they're winning that. They would have won that way. So, but so I'm happy about that. I, they're a fun team. I like Matt Stafford. I'm happy they. I'm happy they made it. Um. But yeah, it was it was a really exciting. I mean, it's this is a fun kind of fresh new Super Bowl, so I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely, and I, I want to ask you this, Ryan, because this was my opinion after the Bengals Chiefs game, as far as like from a Bills perspective. Call me crazy, but I almost felt better that the Bengals won this game as a Bills fan, because I think what the Bengals kind of showed a lot of people was all this talk about Bills Chiefs being the AFC championship game and the winner of that game is going to go to the Super Bowl. They kind of proved everybody wrong. And as much as, of course, I do think that had Cincinnati had to come to Buffalo, I think the Bills probably would have beat them. But it wasn't like the guarantee that everyone made it out to be, you know, for the Bills or Chiefs. And in a weird way, it almost made me feel better that even if Buffalo wins, we don't know they go to a Super Bowl. They might lose at home the very next week to Cincinnati. So I don't know if you felt like that, if I'm in the minority for feeling like that, but it always made me feel better that the Bengals not only just put up a fight, I mean, they won the game and that like, okay, they're for real. We can't act like that. It didn't matter who, you know, that, that the AC championship game didn't mean anything, you know? Yeah. We don't have to live in that world where, you know, if they had run through them, then we, you know, we would have said, well, we would have run through them. I, like I said, I, I think the bills could have matched up well against a team like that. Um, but you never know. I mean, they made a really impressive adjustment in that game. It doesn't. It, it feels good seeing them beat. I don't have the the hate in my heart that some people have for the Chiefs. I get it. I don't have. I really like Pat Mahomes. I really like Andy Reid. I know their fans on Twitter can be a little obnoxious, but I like the Chiefs, so I, I don't have the same anger in my heart <laughs> for them. But I get it. I, I I do get it. And the one other thing I will say is, I think the reason I kept picking, I lost a lot of money betting on Cincinnati this year. Even as they got good, the, one of the first bets I lost this year was betting against them in that Vikings game, and that there was the Week One game, and I just kept on betting against them. and And I think it's something about the Bengals helmet. I, looking at the Bengals helmet, I in my mind that is like tied to losing, and like that's why it's so weird for them to be in the playoffs. I, there's some, it's like it, it's some psychological thing. Like I can't get over it. Just seeing the Bengals on the field, I was like, the Bengals are bad, even though they've always kind of been decent. I don't know. I just can't right. get that out of my head. So, but you know, good for them. I don't know if you the, shout out to the city of Cincinnati for canceling school a day after the Super Bowl. If if I was president, that's the first thing I would do is is the day after the Super Bowl a uh, a holiday. So good for them. You know, it's good. You know, and I like to see new cities, right? Cincinnati, yeah. similar to Buffalo, a team that starved for starved for championships. And you know, I think the last time I don't know when the Reds won a World Series, but. Last time they have a championship, so good for them. Good sports city. But let's talk some bills here because let's do it. We have free agents we want right. to look at. And free agency obviously doesn't open until March. We want to kind of look at who is leaving this team, who is and kind of prime ourselves for what these offensive moves might look like. And so we kind of are gonna go through this in two ways. We kind of have the first group of players that are – we're going to kind of just talk about in one group and try to pick out the players that we might want out of that group because they're kind of C-tier players for one reason or another. And then we'll kind of go through the the more blue-chip players, the more B-minus, B-plus players that, that warrant more conversation. So I'm going to read this first list to you guys. You, Mitch, and – I just want tell me what names on here stick out to you as someone who you might want to bring back. And so this list that I have in this first group is Tyrell Dotson, Saran Neal, Justin Zimmer, Jake Kumaro, Bobby Hart, Taiwan Jones, Effie Obata, Mitch Trubisky, and Matt Breida. 
on that list, what names stick out to you? Two names for me. Uh, number one, Saran Neal, I think is, you can make an argument he's their best special teams player. He, although he's never really figured out as a real defensive weapon, um, he is so good uh, on, on kick and punt coverage. And he's a guy that, Bill, I, I, I think Buffalo would be crazy to let walk. I think he's going to get re-signed. I, I don't see how Brandon Bean lets him go. And the other guy is Mitch Trubisky. Uh, I think he will probably get an opportunity somewhere else. I really do, especially when you consider some of the quarterbacks that got rolled out this season as starters. It's hard to imagine that Mitch Trubisky would at least not get uh, an opportunity to compete. That being said, as, as Brandon Bean said, if Mitch doesn't find what he's looking for, he's got a roster spot here. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll happily make him a part of this team again. And I think that that's a name to, to keep an eye on because, you know, for, he, for the first time in the, in, in the Bean McDermott area or era, um, they actually had someone at backup quarterback. They didn't scare you. You know, they didn't have Nathan Peterman. They didn't have Derek Anderson. It wasn't a Matt Barkley. It was a guy that you actually felt that if God forbid anything happened to Josh Allen, he could weather the storm. So for so I, I think those are the two guys in particular that I think Buffalo, I mean, Saran Neal, they need to resign. And if and if things don't look good for Mitch Trubisky in free agency, he's not getting the market he wants or he thought he'd get. Uh, I think Buffalo would be crazy not to add him right back to the team. But all the, uh, the rest of these guys, though, I, I think for the most part you could do without. I mean, there's a few names I know the fans kind of like, but I, I, I those are the only two names that really stick out to me. I don't know about you, Ryan. So you brought up special teams. So Ron Neal is definitely someone that I'd like to see back at the right price. You can save, and when you look at, we'll get into this later, a guy that you can save money from moving on from, like $3 million, is Tyler Medikevich. If you can take Tyler Medikevich's money, cut him, and kind of move to Ron Neal, I think that's a very, something I love to see. A younger draft pick, I still think can somehow find a role in this defense. He's found his way onto the field time to time. And that week five game where they beat Kansas city, he had a pretty big role. Granted it was with Matt Milano, not there. So they had to play more dime. Um, so like I said, you're right there. Mitch Trubisky. It'd be cool. I really want to see Mitch Trubisky get a job somewhere else. We can get a nice little comp pick in 2023. You know, if, if, if Brian Dable wants to take him along with him, I don't know if he was stored in the back of his pickup truck when he was pulling up to uh, to New York, but he's someone I would love to see go with them. But it's always good to have a good backup quarterback um, because you never know what with the way Josh plays. He's always one play away, one bad hit away from going out. But the only other name that I really pulled out, because you said special teams, is Taiwan Jones because you know we've seen how special teams can can – you never notice special teams when it's good, but you definitely notice special teams when it's bad. And you don't want to lose too many special teamers. And it gets harder to keep guys like that as your roster gets deeper. And we really we had that conversation with a bunch of guys this offseason. We talked about it with Daryl Johnson. We talked we've talked about it before with Tyler Medakavich. We've talked about it with Andre Smith. We've talked about all these different guys they have on the roster. And as it gets deeper, how do you parse out? depth players for, for offensive defense and guys who are going to come in and really just be special teams players. And a guy like Taiwan Jones, who's been a special team player, not just for Buffalo, for a lot of teams, is someone at the right price I'd like to see stick around just because he brings he, he just brings a good presence. He's voted, been voted a captain, so you know players respond to him. And besides that, there's no one, Terrell Dobson, someone they, they, they've developed, but Hasn't really been able to see the field much, obviously, because of A.J. Klein. If they move on from a guy like A.J. Klein, is that someone that maybe could take his spot? But there's no one on there that screams me, screams to me that, hey, you need to be kept. The one thing that I think people might gravitate towards on that list is Justin Zimmer. Of note with him, one coming off a season, a season ending injury. And he's not young. I think people think he's young. He's going to be like 30 like he's floated around the nfl for a while great story great everything but i i think that's what it is a great story and i wish it well but i don't think that's the one you necessarily need to bring back onto the roster next year the next name i kind of want to go over because he's unique right is ryan bates and ryan bates is a restricted free agent what that means is that the Bills basically have right of first refusal on his contract. They have three options 
to do them. You can do a first round tender, which means anyone who tries to sign them has to give up a first round pick this year. That's projected to be 5.5 million. You can do a second round tender. Same thing. Anyone you'd sign would have to do would have to be a would have it would be 3.9 million for the year. Anyone who wants to sign it would have to give up a second round pick and right of first refusal, which just means bills have the right to match it at 2.4 million dollars i think they were last they did that with like bacher i think this year they've done it before with guys like ryan groy so it's something they've used before um i think everyone likes ryan Bates. so i assume i'm assuming penn state guy too he's someone you probably want back on this team when you look at those values look at those contracts what kind of do we sign him outright do you look to tender him what do we do with ryan Bates, a guy who really came on strong at the end of the year here i i i would think that the bill's Probably tender him would be my guess. I don't think they're going to sign him outright to an extension. Uh, just because at the end of the day, as highly as I think Bills fans think of Ryan Bates and this team thinks of Ryan Bates in this front office, it was still only a handful of games. I think you need to see what you have in him for a full season and what that looks like for Ryan Bates. So my guess is they tender him. I don't think he gets poached off the Bills. I think he remains a Buffalo Bill, but I just don't see the Bills laying out a fat extension for him just because right now they, they got some other players they got to take care of um, and other contracts they have upcoming. Um, so uh, as much as I don't think he gets that extension, I don't think the bills are going to let him just walk out of Buffalo. I think they're going to make an effort to keep him along just because with how inconsistent and up and down the old line play has been. And on top of the fact that Bobby Johnson, wh- whether you thought highly of him or not, you know, your, your old line coach has been there for the last three, four years and now gone. Any guy that you believe can come in there and be a steady presence on that online, you got to keep him. And I think Ryan Bates is exactly that. Right, right. And then, you know, it's always exciting when guys come on at the end of the year like this. You always run the risk of someone turning back into a pumpkin. I don't think he played what, like, I think he played enough games where it seems like he's actually good and not just a flash in the pan. But that said, you, you're never sure. And if, if you can protect them with a second round pick like that and, I really think that's probably the way to go. Will I, would I be upset if they give him two, three year contract? No, but I, I just think that is, I think when you have the ability to just, just do that, when you had to, to control the price for a year like that, I think that's what you do. Cause I don't think anyone's going to come around giving up a second round pick for him. And Hey, if they do, and someone wants to outbid you for Ryan Bates and give you a second round pick, cool, let them. And then we'll go draft a, uh, we'll use that pick to go get another, uh, you know, a guard in the second round in the draft. So I really think that's the way to go. So let next thing we kind of have on this list is the other guard uh, on this line who started, a, who started a bunch of games the last two years. Ike Bakker tore his Achilles. I don't know what his timetable is on this injury, but he's played a lot of snaps, had a bunch of starts for this team. Is Ike Bakker someone you look to bring back to this team? If he didn't tear his Achilles, Ryan, I think he'd almost be a lock to be back on this team just because of the money you can save from getting rid of a guy like John Feliciano and how Cody Ford has just been kind of a train wreck. But his Achilles injury really complicates things. I don't really, I, 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 I really am not so sure what the Bills are going to do with Ike Bucker. He's a tough, he's a tough case. I wouldn't be surprised if they move on from him though because. At the end of the day, um, you know, I, I I think that he is a decent player and someone that you would like to have as a backup guard, but you can also probably find an Ike Bucker elsewhere that's not coming off an Achilles injury because as much as good old linemen are kind of hard to find, steady average backup old linemen are not as, as, as tough to like, you know, to get exactly. So, Personally, I would move on from Mike Bucker just because an Achilles injury is really serious, Ryan. I mean, I hate to say it because he, he you know, he he sounds like a good dude and a, and a guy that's really liked in that locker room, but you just have no idea how he's going to be after it. He could be a disaster. He could really have, you know, lost a, a step. So personally, I think I'd move on from Mike Bucker. I think you'd find a guy like that in the draft, probably, which you hope the Bills go a little O line heavy, not to get too far down the road. Um, so I'd move on from Mike. The next one we have on our list, I'm going to kind of lump these three guys together because I think one of these guys, no one really wants back. And the other two are two very similar, very similar with where they are in their career. 
and I think it has really been the brunt of the discussion going into this offseason. That's Vernon Butler, Mario Addison, Jerry Hughes. I'm assuming neither of us want Vernon Butler anymore. I don't think anyone in the world wants Vernon Butler. I don't think anyone besides Vernon Butler's parents want Vernon Butler on the team at this point anymore. So when you look at that group of three, specifically Mario Addison, Jerry Hughes, do we keep either of them? Do we keep one of them? How do you look at that unit going into the offseason, particularly those two players? You know, Ryan, it pains me to say this because I, I don't know about you, but I, I I love Jerry Hughes. He's one of my favorite Bills players just because, you know, he's one, he's the only drought guy left, you know, and a guy that has really, his career has had such a twist and winds and turns about his time in Buffalo. And he's somebody that um, as much as his play has diminished, he's still a guy that I really like, but I can't justify paying money for Jerry Hughes. He had like two, what, two sacks a season. I mean, I get he gets pressure, but you drafted three guys over the last two seasons to be at the edge. You, you know, eventually got to move on, you know? And although Jerry Hughes, I like, I think he's a potential wall of famer. I think, I think the bill's got to move on. And I agree with you. I think Vernon Butler stinks. Um, I, I honestly thought they should have cut him last season. Uh, somehow he made it on this roster and he was ineffective uh, as he was the year before. Addison's the one that's tough. I don't know what your thoughts are on, 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 are on um, Mario Addison, Ryan, but I kind of would like the Bills to maybe keep him around for the right price, of course, just because he did have seven sacks and he had some really nice games for this team and that I still think with all the young guys they have, having a veteran around isn't the worst thing. Now, it doesn't, now if they can get a better veteran in, say, a, a Cam Jordan or someone along those lines, then maybe you say, all right, F Mario Addison, we'll bring in a real, you know, a, a, a legitimate presence there. But Addison's the one guy out of those three that I wouldn't be opposed to the Bills bringing back. But I think Hughes and Butler got to go. I mean, he's been the Bills, Mario Addison's been the Bills leading set sack the last two years. He seems to play with a little more juice than the rest of the, the other defensive ends on the line this year. And if you can keep a guy for depth, I think you're right. That's the guy you can get. If you look at spot, no, I'm sorry, over no, spot track. Right now, it has projections for Jerry Hughes. It says he will be around three point three million. Um, it doesn't have anything for for Mario Addison, but that's the way I've been leaning to, and I'm stuck, right? Because I don't want to sit here, and you don't want to rely on hope going into a season, right? You don't want to hope Carlos Bastian and Greg Rousseau are ready to take on starting roles on both ends of those lines. You want to have some sort of safety net. But at the same time, you don't want them to have snaps taken away anymore. You want them to get a higher amount of snaps. I, I really think Carlos Basham came along pretty well at the end of the year, all things considered, with the little amount of time he was able to see the field. He definitely flashed at times. He ended up with a couple sacks. Greg Rousseau, for a guy who was supposed to be super raw, played the run super well, was top 10 super in run stop well. win rate which that in of itself I think is really valuable. And if he can just put together a pass rush, he's going to be a really fantastic player for this team. So it's tough. But I, I think if you really want to get a fresh start in this line, open up and, and really open up maybe a new possibility, some fresh eyes and fresh bodies in that room, I think you got to let them walk. I think you got to take a risk. Like we talked about the Rams taking a risk with their team. I, I think letting both these guys, you got to take the risk that – a, Greg Rousseau, Carlos Basham already. B, that you can find someone somewhere, whether that's in a draft again, whether that's in free agency again, whether you can find a... Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, whether that's even... We talked about the Rams, whether that's dealing some picks to go yeah. get your, yourself, because, I mean, the Rams did that with Von Miller, and that's made pay dividends for them. So, I, I yeah, all right, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of with you on that yeah. one. Yeah, and, and you look around the league, like, I know he's also old, are the Saints trying to fire sale? You know, if the Saints have a fire sale, are you calling for Cam Jordan? If are the Vikings, are they going to have a fire sale? Are they going to look to move to Neil Hunter? Right. Mm. So, so like I said, I, I think that's maybe a position when you look at how valuable the pass rush is and, and how teams the last couple of years have really won games. Maybe they shouldn't have with pass rush. I think you take a risk with that spot. And then, like you said, I, I, I really, really love Jerry Hughes. He's, he, he's been such a backbone. I'm trying to start and sit here and think who, after he leaves, who the next most tenured bill will be on this roster. But um, 
yeah, I, I think it's time for both of those guys to probably, you know, whether Jerry's retiring, whether, whether, um, you know, he goes on to another team. It's definitely time for both of those guys to, to, to move on from that spot. Moving along the defensive line, a guy who really came along this year is Harrison Phillips. He has a spot track projection of, as it pulls up here, and of course now it's unloaded. Harrison Phillips, who came along really well at the end of the year and took really took stars starting spot. Spot track has him calculated as in predicted at 5.4 billion. That seems a little high considering he's just really kind of had one good season, but really played some really good football towards the end of this year. Where do you stand on Harrison Phillips? And and let me frame it in this way, I think, because I think everyone would love to see Harrison Phillips back based Mm -hmm. on how he play. How much are you willing to, how bad do you want Harrison Phillips? How much are you willing to pay Harrison Phillips? I mean, the the bills are in a position where they can't quote unquote break the bank, right? But I think Harrison Phillips is, is arguably, Ryan, their biggest priority to re-sign this offseason. Um, at the end of the season, he was playing so well. And you saw how good that was for Ed to have that like really t- like you know tough block uh I'm, I'm, I'm playing on the words, just eating up double teams, getting some penetration, getting a little pass rush. Like for me, Harry Phillips is a guy they gotta resign. Now, of course. If he gets offered a ton of money elsewhere, you can't be, you know, too crazy here if you're Buffalo. And at the end of the day, you might need to move on from him. But I think the Bills need to make a real effort here to make sure Harrison Phillips doesn't leave Buffalo. He stated publicly that he doesn't want to leave. They gotta, they gotta find something that's gonna work for him because I think that he's just starting to finally come into his own and be that player that when the Bills drafted out of Stanford, they thought they'd get, which is you know, quote unquote. Kyle Williams 2.0 and you know he's not quite that but you see why he was you know a really highly regarded prospect coming out so I think Harry Phillips is a guy that unless he gets offered a ton of money elsewhere you gotta you you gotta find a way to get him back in Buffalo yeah and I almost think the way to go with him is I think you gotta give him a one-year deal because once again he hasn't right he hasn't consistently shown it he put it together this year, and I really think the play is if he continues to play this way, he probably plays himself out of Buffalo's price range. If you can get him on a one-year deal and have him play the way he played this year over 17 games plus, you can get yourself a nice little comp pick, right? That, that's what these conversations are going to start morphing into is how can you get yourself some comp picks. If you can get him in a one-year, one-year deal, get him to play the way he did and say, all right, go test the market again and go get paid somewhere else. I really think that's the way to do it. I I don't love paying guys like that for a one year production. I don't love paying guys for, you know, for half a year production like that, you know, when they've been here as long as he has, but I think a one year deal is really really fair. I don't like that spot track number. I don't think it's right, but then get them under that. I, I really think that would, benefit this line because really seeing him being there also really seemed to help at Oliver. Yep. Two more, you know, we'll, we'll look at another position group as a whole before we kind of get into the, the one player that I think will be the most talked about of this group. Well, maybe the, this, this one, this guy will be the most talked about in this group seeing how popular he is, but two receivers have our, our free agents this year. One is Emmanuel Sanders. The other is Isaiah McKenzie. Um, I'll say on the front end of this, it doesn't sound like Emmanuel Sanders wants to come back. Brandon Bean made a comment in his press conference that he would love to have him back, but even he thinks he doesn't want to come back. Um, And then we have Isaiah McKenzie. So I guess we can kind of focus on Isaiah McKenzie. Where do you stand on him? Is he, where do you see his value at? What would you be comfortable bringing him back at? Um, it, you know, McKenzie's a tough case, uh, just because he, in 2020, right, was such a gadget player for this offense. Didn't really have a legit role as a receiver, but he was that gadgety, flashy guy. And yeah, he scored a lot of touchdowns and was very productive. And of course, you know, the whole social media thing with him and you, Ryan, we don't even need to get into that whole saga. But 
He I have never once said a bad word about Isaiah McKenzie. Listen, listen. Hey, you, 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 you had some merit there, but focusing on, you know, McKenzie now, I mean, listen, Isaiah, like, he proved at the end of the year that he, he can be a receiving option. You know, he can be a receiver in this league. Now, does that mean offer him a big bag because he had a, you know, a huge game against New England? No, I, I, I think that the contract, the numbers he was getting, um, initially last off season, which I think was like two years, like 6 million. I think it was like the contract the Bears supposedly offered him. I wouldn't be too upset giving him something like that. You know, it still is a fairly cheap deal. Um, but again, you're not breaking the bank for Isaiah McKenzie. Let's just face it. I mean, you, you just don't, the bills don't have the money to just pay Isaiah McKenzie handsomely. And you could easily see a team, Ryan, that is so receiver needy, just offering him something a little, a little too much. That could very well happen. So for the right price. Yeah. I'd like to see McKenzie back. I think he has a chance to develop into a decent receiver on this team and someone that Allen clearly has a little bit of a rapport with, but you can't be breaking the bank for Isaiah McKenzie. That's just the bottom line of it. Um, and then real quick, yeah, I think Emmanuel Sanders is probably just going to retire after the season. But that's my opinion on, on, on McKenzie. I'm curious to Ryan uh, what, what your thoughts are on a little dirty. I'm going to stay a little on brand here. I think he had some really good games to end this season. We There's too much. People view him too much as this, this guy that we're not using enough. And we've had two seasons for him to establish himself. And he's played well. He's played well in some games. He burned the Patriots twice. But there's games where he's a non-factor. And folks, I, I saw this take at the time. He's not Tyreek Hill. He's not Debo Samuel. He's yep. not going to be this guy that we can build our offense around as an offensive weapon. Right? But some people, like you said, might seem like that. If you're, if you're looking at a guy who loves Brian Dable, Isaiah McKenzie is one of those dudes and maybe Brian Dable and Joe Shane over there in New York see him as someone who can kind of be that megaphone for their culture. I talk, I'll talk right. talk about another play in a second that could be that, but on the you know he could be a guy that that knows that system in a in a position room that's a lot more needy than Buffalo over there could could be that guy if he's willing to play cheap again, whatever, sign me up. But. There's a reason why he only got a couple, whatever it was, a million, two million this year. And I hope, I hope he goes and gets paid elsewhere. And then this might sound like me trying to stick to a bad take. If he comes back, cool. Awesome. But again, you look at the production over the last two years, and I think there's more to it than, well, they're just not using him. I, I think there's more to it than that. Now, the one that I think will garner the most discussion mainly mm. because Spot Track has him at $10 million, which I really don't think is accurate, but sometimes Spot Track is accurate. Spot Track has him at $10 million. Levi Wallace, again, is a free agent, played the last quarter of the season as a CB1. And again, this is a value discussion again, because we know what Levi Wallace is. Right. How comfortable, let's frame it this way. How comfortable would you be letting Levi Wallace walk this offseason with the state of our secondary and mainly the quarterback. I, I mean, I'd like to keep Levi, but I, Ryan, I just think he, he priced himself out of Buffalo with the season we, he had, which first of all, credit to Levi Wallace for UDFA to be in a business right now where I think he's going to get paid pretty good money. Um, but that money's just not coming from Buffalo. Again, they just don't have the cap room to pay what he's going to probably get. I mean, especially with Tredavious White going out, that only increases market even further. So as much as I would have definitely liked to keep Levi Wallace around, I actually like Levi Wallace. I think he gets a lot of criticism, unfairly so, from a lot of Bills fans. Um, I just don't think they have the ability to keep him as far as the cap's concerned. So am I comfortable with him walking? I mean, not 100%. I mean, Dane, da Dane Jackson played pretty well at the end of the year. But again, it's a seventh-round pick who athletically – and physically is a little limited. I, I don't know what his long-term sort of projection is. Maybe the Bills go and, and, and draft a kid. Who knows? Either way, I mean, Levi Wallace is a steady veteran. He's a guy that knows the system, so it's definitely going to be a bit of a loss for Buffalo, but I just don't see any way that he stays in Buffalo. I just think he's priced himself out of here. I almost hope that he does leave because I think Buffalo needs a reason to draft a quarter cornerback or go after. A I agree. High. And 
I think we learned this year. Levi Wallace is great as a cornerback too, but not really what you want against top flight offenses as a cornerback one. And I really think it's finally time to address that other spot. And as, as, as stable as Dane Jackson is over there, I think you can really benefit from some athletic cornerbacks and cornerbacks. And it's not just speed, right? We're not RASC or scouting, but just guys that have more physical traits, more, you know, whether that's size, whether that's speed, whatever it is, just guys that bring a little bit more to the table and letting Levi Wallace walk, which again could yield count into that comp pick formula, right? If we could, lose some exactly. of these guys. Mitch Trubisky, you know, Mitch Trubisky gets a nice little deal from someone. If he gets a nice little deal from someone, you know, that really can start to count into those comp picks. And that's, you know, that's what teams start doing, right? That's how the Patriots operated for years was comp picks, comp picks, comp picks. Um, so he's a guy that, once again, probably was never as bad as people thought. But I think the teams will view him as, will, will, will view him differently than we view him as and i hope he gets paid he deserves it um and i you know he view, he, he he deserves he deserves a nice big payday just not from buffalo now we have a list here of guys i have a list and i'm just going to ask you to see if there's any that speak to you as guys that maybe restructured maybe maybe cut maybe traded whatever guys that have significantly different cap hit to to dead cap ratios. What I'm saying is guys you can cut and save a chunk of money from. So those are guys like Cole Beasley. These are guys like Daryl Williams probably has the biggest savings this year. Guys like Tyler Medikevich, Daryl Williams, John Feliciano. And I think the other star Latula to a lesser extent, AJ Klein to a lesser extent. When you look at some of the names on that list, who is one that who's one or two that you stick out that you can say I'm comfortable, you know, losing him and, and taking his kept space and moving it elsewhere. Uh, the one I'm the most comfortable with is John Feliciano. I mean, Ryan, we talked about it all season that 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 signing that extension really backfired on them. It, it, he just is not, he's not a bad player. He's not that good. And you talked about guys who could come over and be, you know, culture, you know, sort of, you know, cheerleaders, right? Uh, uh, for Dayball. Well, John Feliciano is a big Bobby Johnson guy. I mean, that's the big reason why he even came to Buffalo to begin with was because of his relationship with Bobby Johnson, who's now the Giants O-line coach. So personally, I say cut cut Feliciano, let him go to New York. I think the Bills could do a hell of a lot better at that backup position. And they just don't need to be spending that money on, on a guy who at best is average. Um, the other guy that speaks to me, you know, people talk about Cole Beasley. I'm a little bit with Brandon Bean where I don't think I want to just flat out cut Cole Beasley, but I'd like to get him on something that's a lot cheaper because I think at this point in his career, he's just not worth the money that they have him signed for, but he's also worth still having around. I think just getting rid of him for nothing is a little pointless. Yeah, is he slow? Yeah, is he, you know, not the player he once was absolutely, but he still has some value as a wide receiver for on this team. Someone that can just, you know, can help coach up a young slot guy that they're likely going to have to add to this team during the off season. So those are the two that mainly stick out to me. I mean, Daryl Williams, Ryan, I'm actually curious what your take is on Daryl Williams. Cause I think he is a really interesting decision there because as much as he played decent at guard this year and had some very good moments, he's getting paid tackle money. Like, I'm just curious what you do there because he's the one guy in that list, Ryan, that I'm just kind of stumped on. I don't know what the right decision is with him. I would love to see that be a rework deal. And and it's tough because exactly like you said, and it was one of the reasons why we didn't think they would be willing to move on from him, this, or willing to move him because he is getting paid tackle money, not guard money, tackle money. Um, you can save, you can save, um, you can save, I think it's $7 million from moving on from him. They structured his contract really smart in that way. But it, he's a guy that if you move, like I, I said, Levi Wallace, you know, move on from him because I hope they get better. But if you move on from, cause I'm fine with Trey white and Dane Jackson, if that's the baseline, I don't know if I'm comfortable with Ryan Bates and whatever would be the other side 
of the guard spot, right? I'm, I'm not comfortable with that alternative. And I, I think the nice thing about a bunch of these spots, Cole Beasley, Daryl Williams, I, you look at some of these spots and I think you say, even Tyler Medikevich, who can save money on, I think you look at those guys and, and you take a really hard look at them at camp. And if you can move on from them in camp, and make some, you know, some of these guys are post Jones first cuts, which means their cap split gets hit over the course of two years. I really think that's something you could do. But the one guy that, that sticks out on this list to me more than anyone is, like you said, John Feliciano. You can say it's only about three million or three and a half million in saving, but I don't want to pay someone 4.9 because they're a versatile backup. And he's someone that if I'm Brandon Bean, I'm calling my buddy Joe Shane over in New York because he played with Bobby Johnson in Oakland, number one. He has been one of Brian Dable's biggest, biggest hype man on this team. And someone that I think can really be, I, I said on Twitter, the Mike Tolbert, what Mike Tolbert was to Sean McDermott. And he said, well, Mike, Mike Tolbert sucked. Yes, that's not what I mean. Mike Tolbert was the, was the mouthpiece, was the megaphone to Sean McDermott's culture, to what he was trying to build in year one. And I think John Feliciano can be a guy who's, probably better than what they have in the offensive line room over in New York right now and can be that, that megaphone that, you know, that player mouthpiece for what Brian Dable and what Joe Shane are trying to bring into that organization. So he's someone that I, if I, if I'm the bills, I am calling New York and say, Hey, you want him? Give us, give us a night. I'll take a seventh round pick for him. Cause I want to call cut him out. Right. But if you want to throw a nice little seventh round pick our way for him, nice little sixth round pick for him, he's all yours. Take him. I think that would be absolutely perfect. And the only other guy that I really have, I, I would have trouble keeping is Tyler Matakevich because I, I think at some point when you get to this point in your life cycle as a team and Josh's cap hit goes up to 16 million next year before it goes up to, to 30 million plus in the next few years after that. And you can only have so many of these guys, these special teams, these specialists that you're yeah. paying top dollar and for him top dollar is three million whatever it is he's making but for a special team for a special teams only player that's a lot and at some point you need to do something like i said if you can take that money shift it to someone younger like maybe a tyrell dotson maybe a saran neal and get younger in special teams and get cheaper in special teams and keep that same quality of play i really think that's something you can do to once again save money um and that that's the list there is there any there's those are kind of the guys that we have cheap um you know guys you we also aj klein someone i wouldn't mind star is obviously someone that i think doesn't have the same savings so i think probably coming back next year but once again a lot of names to monitor a lot of things to monitor going into the off season um but that's really it that's all we have for the show today do you have anything to add mitch no, I think I think we kind of hit on everything as far as as, as kind of the caps all concerned. But Ryan, I know you do have an announcement for our our, yeah. our listeners, so I'm gonna so, put the spotlight on you, my friend. So if you've listened to the 63 minute to to minute 63 here in all our shows, where I, I think we're actually about a year plus old today, I'm stepping away from BF and I'm stepping away from the show. Um, after next week, next week's my last show. And it has nothing to do with anything over at PF, nothing to do with Mitch or anything. I'm leaving because I've taken on some new responsibilities with my job at, at school, just doing some things outside of hours. Um, I'm planning a wedding, which is surpri not surprisingly a lot of work. And also, I've just been spending too much time online and I'm trying to be more present in my life. So I'm stepping, uh, I'm stepping down from 585 Report next week. So next week's my last uh, show on here. And it really makes me sad, but it's something that needed to be done. So um, I'll be looking forward to our last show. I'm going to miss Mitch, but I hope to catch everyone back here next week for one last, one last show. You heard that everyone tune in. It's going to be an extravaganza. <laughs> I, I, I think next week, but uh, yep. So as far as the future of the show is concerned, we'll you know keep you updated as what you know what happens uh, with this. Uh, but yes, Ryan is uh, going to be hanging it up after <laughs> next week. So uh, that about does it here for the five a five report. Thank you guys for listening, and we will see you guys next week.
have a great 